is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Finding Forrester, brought to you by Anonymous. In this episode, Rashawn and I discuss this film that is better than I thought it was going to be based on the poster. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh, let that be a lesson to you all. Welcome <laughs> to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm Natasha. I am Rashawn, joining for a special Spoil Me dun, dun, episode. Dun. <laughs> um, so, yeah, this, like, because you and I, spoilers for everybody, I, are full disclosure, I watched this movie when I was very young, um, and I didn't remember anything about it. All I remembered was that at one point, Sean Connery talks about how socks are poorly designed and the seam is on the inside, so he wears them inside out. Um, and that was that was it. And I had I, I thought I was remembering what happened as I watched the movie, and I was wrong about that. <laughs> so basically, it's I had never seen this movie before. Like we can just go into it acting like I, it was brand brand new. Um, so what did you think of this? I had really, I didn't remember this movie at all um, when I looked it up to see where I could watch it playing. And it was like from 2000. And I was just like, holy shit. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't remember this being a thing at all. I had very low expectations um, because this type of older white person, inner city youth story gets done to death. Yeah. And they're usually not really good. But I ended up being pleasantly surprised. I thought that it had some really funny, good moments. Mm -hmm. This kid, I don't know why he's not famous. I thought he gave a hell of a performance. I don't remember ever seeing him anywhere else. Yeah, but you know, I'm going to IMDb him right now and see. Yeah, I think his name is like Ron Brown or something. Is his name Ron Brown? I might be just making that up. That's I could have swore that's what his name really was. really not good. No wonder you didn't get famous. Who's going to get hey, famous hey, for that kind of name? Rob, um, Brown. like it's just the most boring. Like Rob, Rob. It's not much better. No, it's Rob Brown. Rob, Brown. but I thought he was like I couldn't take my eye off of him when he was on the screen. I just thought he really had a great presence. Yeah. Agreed. Let's see. Rob, He's nice Brown He was was born in Harlem and raised in Brooklyn. He's very handsome. He is. Damn. I thought he was a really good looking kid in the movie, but I'm looking at pictures of him now. Oh, he was in Don John. Oh God. Uh, Coach Carter. There goes one. Um, I never saw that one. Thanks. I never watched it either. He was in The Dark Knight Rises. Oh. Yeah, I, I haven't I seen any that. of these things that he's been in. He was on Treme. That's something uh, that has been recommended to me a number of times. Same. I've never watched. I've seen like one or two episodes here and there, but I've heard it's fantastic. He's been in a bunch of movies, but none of them I've seen. And the TV looks series like called Blind Spot. I never heard of. Oh yeah, that was on. It's on NBC. Hmm. Never heard of it. So good for him, I guess. But yeah, he is a very good-looking young man. I shouldn't even call him young man because now he's my age. He's <laughs> old. Yeah, I guess in two thousand, like you were just uh, what are you like fifteen or something? <laughs> How does math go? That was 19 oh years ago. So <laughs> 34 minus 10 is 24 minus 9 is, yeah, 15. <sighs> <sighs> wow. Yeah. But won't. 2000 is a round number. I would have expected you to work from the year you were born and just go up to 2000. 1986. So that's so 16. Depending on what month. I would have been mm. 15 or 16. Um, so I was 25. Okay. Already by 2000, which is a bummer. <laughs> but, well, I remember yeah, being like 20, younger 25. when I saw it, so I have a skewed memory of it. Mm. Um, but okay, so yeah, like you said, this this starts off with some like first, first of all, I do want to address the poster, which 
is the goofiest thing because wait let me look at this poster i really like the bottom part which is what i used for our uh event banner which is you know him standing oh by his bicycle. why is sean car he's like oh he's like the whole sky he's the whole sky Jesus Christ. And he's just like so fr- – and I get it. He has the name recognition. People are going to come see mm-hmm. a Sean Connery movie. So, okay. Mm-hmm. But it does make it look like he's like this like godlike sort of paternalistic, you know. That is unfortunate image. And the um, image below it of the, the two sun. of them – What's that? I just said he's the sun and everything just – he just shines on everyone. Yeah. <laughs> And the image below it of the two of them standing out in the basketball court with his bike never happened, right? They He doesn't leave the house. So Well, there's a, the last scene we see with them together is when he, when Sean Connery is leaving the school after having, you know, Yeah, talked. that's true. Okay. And they walk outside and he's on his bike and he literally just rides his bike away. That's right. the last time we see him. Yeah, that was like so. This sort of gives th- this impression that this is a guy that's like out and about in the neighborhood, and mm-hmm. it's just so not that as it turns out. Um, yeah. So when we start off, he's peering at these kids through the window with his binoculars because mm-hmm. uh, he's a bird watcher, but also a people watcher. Yeah, yeah, and the he has this reputation in the neighborhood of just like this um this mythology around him you know like ooh, the, they call him the window mm-hmm. you know mr um, window and- <laughs> <laughs> wait what, what is happening is you ever heard that song oh my god it didn't sound familiar i'll um, send it to you later so you know what's his deal uh is he a murderer why is he shut up in the house why does he live here you know, there's just all these, like, weird neighborhood stories swirling around him because he's so mysterious. Um, I also love Jamal's little friends. His little friends. Um, his uh, it was like a, little friends. I, I love it. <laughs> I kept waiting for there to be a side drama, you know? Mm-hmm. One of them is going to be pulled to be a drug dealer or go down a dark uh. path. Or, or, you know, one of them is going to get shot. And... and that didn't happen. They were just nice, good, regular teenage boys. Mm-hmm. Like there was nothing particularly extraordinary about any of them. But you know, the worst trouble they got into was daring Jamal to sneak into the old man's creepy house, mm-hmm. which is a plot that you see often in young adult movies. You know, where there's like an old, like the Sandlot. I think has that whole right. thing going on. You know. Who's going to jump the fence to go in the old man so and so's yard and get the ball back? You right. know, you don't really see that sort of thing for black kids, black males, and teenagers that are like living in the Bronx in the projects. Mm-hmm. So I just thought that was really cute, and um, I don't know. I just I just appreciated that the story didn't decide to do some of those more familiar things. Agreed. Uh, it's interesting that you say that too, like about the side drama because. I was also waiting for one, but what I was waiting for was for his friends to be resentful that he left the school and went and did something mm-hmm. like that. They would be like, mm-hmm. oh, so what are you trying to be like trying to mm-hmm. leave us behind? What are we to you? Right. Like right. And nobody, right. everybody's just like, no, you're really smart. You should be somewhere else. Like right. nobody right. holds it against him at all. There's just a momentary like, oh, look who's come for a visit when he comes back. Mm-hmm. But they don't really seem like resentful of it. They're just sort of like. Exactly. Things are changing, there's, you know. There's a there's a moment after his first game at the new prep school where his friend Fly comes to, to watch mm-hmm. and then tries to get Jamal to go out afterwards. And Jamal's like, I kind of got to go, you know, with the team. Right. And that's a little awkward, you know. And, he, and Fly looks a little, little like, all right, I guess you got to go do what you got to do. You know, you're a big man now. But it's so short-lived and yeah. it doesn't drag on through the whole story. And you're right at the end and I guess it's because maybe because Jamal still lives there I mean he hasn't moved it's not like it's an overnight prep school so he's, yeah. he still sees everybody all the time but, yeah that's um, true yeah I'm, I'm glad they didn't make that a thing either you know yeah. there was none of that questioning your blackness you know or or you know what do you think you're better than us now or you know there just mm-hmm. wasn't any of that yeah and I was like really glad that um 
that Busta Rhymes, who plays his brother, whom I just think is the snuggliest bear, and I love him so much. I don't know why. I've always just had this, like, oh, Busta's here. And this, like, it's different. When I see that Luda's in a movie, Luda, I'm just like, oh, shit. Because he, like, chews scenery and is really, like, uh, he's fun in a different way, whereas Busta's mm-hmm. somebody that I feel like goes and, like, volunteers at animal shelters on the weekend or something. I don't know why oh I have he that idea. He probably does. He probably does. Doesn't he seem like a really soft-hearted, like, good guy? I, and I've mm-hmm. always felt that way. But he, he's so supportive of his brother. Mm-hmm. And I was, like, again, thinking, are they going to make it a thing where he's jealous because he's, like, you know, feeling like his brother is getting all this attention. But it, they sort of just do, like, you're also really smart and you just chose not to really pursue that because you're content. Right. We we know that there was something with um the older brother Terrence uh, he played college basketball mm-hmm. that comes out so that's pretty impressive mm-hmm. um but we don't we don't know why he is just just a parking attendant mm-hmm. at this point right we don't exactly know what happened but whatever happened like you said he seems content whatever happened feels like he's not holding on to bitterness about it mm-hmm. you know um and he's got his whole rhyme thing on the side too, you know. So, oh my God, he starts rhyming about working in the parking lot. It's just like, <laughs> yeah, all right. Uh-huh. But, but I, I just, I, I love that this family doesn't have any of the sort of pathology that we have grown accustomed to seeing black families depicted with. You know, right? Yeah. Like there's, there's comment that he has a father who's a an, an, a drug addict and who has left home. But it the movie doesn't give us any of those scenes, you know. We yeah. don't see him arguing with a with a you know, a strung out father on the corner, you know. We don't you know what I mean? We just it's we don't not see dwelled any on. of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um I will say opening with that uh that a cappella rap though, I don't know about that move. That was terrible. That like <laughs> I get it, like what you were trying to do there, guys, but <laughs> this guy. I, I, like I said, I had pretty low expectations for this movie, and then it, it's just a long, long opening of like New York, and then it goes into the Bronx and all that, and then he's rapping, and I was like, this is not inspiring confidence no. at all. Um, that I think I was kind of already in a place to side eye this movie just like oh is this another one of those fucking white savior movies Mm -hmm. like why do you keep making these movies (laughs) we've had plenty of these movies (laughs) and for real y'all not out here saving nobody like that honestly right yeah (laughs) why do you keep making movies about it but you know i texted you at one point i was like this turned around (laughs) yeah so all right let's we'll talk about how things start off and then you tell me where you felt like it really turned around um so this kid uh Oh my God! Why did I forget his name? Jamal. Jamal, thank you. Um, <laughs> this kid, Jamal, is uh, somebody that all of his teachers and low key his friends, but his friends don't seem to like mm-hmm. bring it up. Mm-hmm. I agree. Everybody seems to know he is above average intelligence. He really enjoys yeah. reading. Yeah, and he's just trying to sort of keep attention off himself because he's uncomfortable mm-hmm. about it, and so under performs in class but mm-hmm. he doesn't hide what he what he can do when he takes standardized tests and that's where everybody right. starts to be like oh shit look at this yeah um and i like the like opening scene where his teacher is talking about the raven and pointedly yeah. asks him if he's read it because she knows this kid probably read it yeah and yeah. he's like uh, I, I don't know I, I never read it and she's like yeah all right yeah she gives him that face like mm-hmm. okay really <laughs> i love too the way she's talking about poe you know about how he's strung out on cocaine and he's a bit of a mess and you know uh and i think that if it had been this is so racist but if it had been a white teacher talking to a black class like that i'd have been like mm-hmm. yeah really yeah <laughs> but um but yeah, I just, I also too, honestly, can we just say really quickly how 
the classroom itself seemed really engaged mm-hmm. in learning. Mm-hmm. It, it was it was like real quick. It was a real quick scene, but it wasn't. You know, we're so often shown inner city schools with black and brown children, and they are like shown in a way that makes it seem like you can't even get them to sit still to pay attention. Right. You know. Um, and her class, even though no one had really read it, they were all still like, they knew enough about who he was and you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It was just, yeah, it was just not, I thought it was going to be, oh, there's going to be like, you know, a fight in the back of the classroom or everybody's going to start calling him names because she called on him to ask him if he had, was familiar with the poem or mm-hmm. none of that. Nope. Yeah, there was um, a moment where, like, one of his friends pipes up about it, and I was like, is he about to say something really stupid about, mm-hmm, you know, like, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. instead, because she says Poe was strung out on coke and obsessed with death, and he's like, oh, so he must, it must have, that must be what the ravens are named after, because they're <laughs> Cause dying they always <laughs> season. <laughs> and uh, I like that, like, he's listening, like, what he says has something to do with what she just said. Mm-hmm. And exactly. she responds to the joke instead of trying to like shush him. Right. She's kind of like. It's a, it's a joke, but it's also like giving him credit for making that connection. Mm-hmm. Because she's like, yeah, the Baltimore Ravens, the only NFL team to be named after, a, you know, an American writer or whatever, however she says it. Right. So, yeah, she she doesn't belittle him for for his brain going to the Ravens and like making a joke. She's right. just like, yeah, come on. Hmm. Yeah, this movie did a lot of little things like that in a way that I was surprised by. Yeah. Yeah, isn't it? Like, I, I'm i I'm talking about this, and I've t- mentioned to you this book that I'm covering for Spoil Me called Grace of Kings. And there is so much that until somebody does something different, you don't realize how tropey certain things are. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. you just expect it to go a certain way. And when they don't do that, it genuinely takes you so by surprise because you're just like programmed by millions mm-hmm. of other stories that go this way. Yeah. Yep. Um, so his mother comes to a, t- a conference with his teacher and his teacher is like, listen, she, he is obviously trying to mm-hmm. keep people from like bagging on him a little bit mm-hmm. by keeping a low profile and not doing that great in class. And his mom is like, I see him reading all the time. And he writes all the time. All he ever talks about is basketball. Mm-hmm. But that's not what I see. And I love that too. Yeah. She's paying attention. She's engaged with her kids. She knows mm-hmm. him. You know, it's not yeah. a shock to her when her teacher, when his teacher tells her this, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so his scores get him the attention of private school. And it's a combo deal of he has really above average score, but also he's a really good basketball player and they Mm -hmm. need somebody to win. So they give him basically like a full ride scholarship Mm -hmm. to this school. And they, they present it in this way. They're like, of course the scholarship is academic, but if you feel like you want to participate on our team, that would be amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, it's it's not the thing where like the the poor black kid gets the scholarship because he's you know he's athletically gifted. I mean he does, but he's also intelligent, right? right? And I like that they suggest that he could have gotten the scholarship or he would get it regardless if he played or not. Mm-hmm. Um, which is interesting because I wonder if he had chosen not to play. How would that have affected the story? Um, yeah. Because it's clear that they really value him as a basketball player above everything else, I think. In the end, yeah. Mm-hmm. But when they when they meet him, they're really like, oh, well, no, we're not here for your basketball. We're here because, you know, you're so just so gifted. Yeah, hmm. I'm not sure they know how good he is basketball-wise when they, like, bring him on. I think that they're like, you know, probably he's good, like going to be a, a boon to the team, but mm-hmm. he like does some amazing shit on the court in like the first game that he plays for the private school. So it seems like they're sort of like, oh, all right. It's like that, yeah. you know, well, when the guy comes to offer the scholarship, he tells them that they watch some of his playing. Mm-hmm. I don't know what that means exactly. Like, 
Does he play on his current on his public school's basketball team? They don't really get don't, into that. Don't see it, right? Yeah, no, I didn't know what he meant really when he said that. Yeah, but but I think you're right. I think that they had an idea that he was probably good, but were really shocked when they got him there. Mm-hmm. Um. Okay, so what did you think of Sean Connery in this role? And I said that with shade, but it was unintentional shade accidental shade if you will i think i don't like sean connery and that colors my perception of his role Mm. um because i think he was perfectly fine but i have just like come to learn some ugly things about him over the past couple years Really? Yeah, he was like in an interview and talking about how he's fine with backhanding a woman if she gets too mouthy sort of thing. Um, oh, yikes. Yeah. So I have this sort of like... I mm, was not aware of that. Because he's very good looking. Good Lord. I mean... Do you see my... Ho- it's my Homer... Well, it's Steve's Homer Simpson mug. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and then in the back it says, just because I don't care doesn't mean I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> Um, guys, those listening, that might have seemed like a complete non sequitur, but we are on camera here for the uh, crowd cast. So she was just picking oh, it up God, and that's showing right. me why. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I uh, forgot for a second. Um, but yeah, so I, I kind of am like trying to not, not like look too hard at him because I just know that I'm... I just have feelings because of a whole other right. unrelated thing. So what about you? I thought it was a little, um, I thought his performance was a little over the top. Mm. Um, but there were some moments where I really thought he did an excellent job. When that scene, when he goes to the, when they go to Madison Square Garden or wherever they go for that basketball game and he gets lost Mm -hmm. and you see him have that panic attack, even though he doesn't have really any words, you know, but you just see his face and the way he's walking. I thought that was really, really good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's, he's, it's a little, it's a little hacky, that performance. Hacky is a good word. It's a little word. (laughs) Yeah. Like it just felt like kind of on the nose in such a way Mm -hmm. of like, oh, Mm -hmm. you're the reclusive writer. And Mm -hmm. they just hit every note of what that traditionally means, which is, you know, when you think about it, we're talking about how everything about the black community and the black student was not something that we expected. And everything predictable is about the white writer. It it really is. That's not bad. That's a better way to fall, (laughs) I guess. If you're going to be predictable, do it in an unpredictable (laughs) way. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's absolutely right because there wasn't there were no surprises in his behavior for me. Yeah, at all. Like you know, immediately as soon as you meet this guy, as soon as you meet uh, William Forrester, you know exactly what's going to happen mm-hmm. with him. You know, you know that he's going to be gruff and not want to talk about personal stuff, but that eventually he will, and mm-hmm. that he will um, is going to be handing out these life lessons, but really. He's going to be the one that learns something from the kid. You know, mm-hmm. that part of the story I thought was just really, really <sighs> kind of boring. Wrote. He wrote. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I really did like this kid, though. Yeah. I really did. Yeah. So, again, with an expectation that was blown up, I thought half the movie was going to be him agonizing over whether to go to this new school. <laughs> nope. nope goes right away yeah he's like immediately like in there and uh suki stackhouse is here to lead him around and flirt with him mm-hmm. and whatnot mm-hmm. um and she was pretty good she was like very direct about everything mm-hmm. and yeah, uh, yeah. i liked claire yeah you know she had a good vibe to her and just was like no yeah. nonsense like mm-hmm. here's the deal um yeah she tells him straight up mm-hmm. i love to when he's trying to get into his locker and it doesn't work and she's like well at least it looks good mm-hmm. right like, like just telling him this is what this place is about. Yeah. You know, it's about appearances. Um, oh, God. I'm thinking about after the basketball game at her house when they're outside and he's teaching her, like, how to guard. And then the dad comes out. Mm-hmm. That also went away, I expected. But it also flipped because when she 
ask him about going out, he's just like, no. Yeah. Mm-mm. Nope. Nope. <laughs> yeah. And I thought that that was going to be this huge part of the movie. Like, we're going to be, like, watching them be star-crossed, and maybe there'll be a big fight about whether he should date her or not, and, you know, there'll be a big scene where she's telling her father, but I love him, you know? Mm-hmm. None of that. Nope, not even. <laughs> yeah, and, and what I liked about the scene where her dad comes out, there is no dialogue. He, oh, like, my God, but his looks face. Looks at him. <sighs> okay. Yeah. Did, didn't need any dialogue. Mm-mm. And fucking what does Jamal do, which is what he does throughout the whole movie, which I just couldn't get enough of, is let me show this motherfucker how smart I am. Because when she goes to walk away and he's like, the answer is, it was Stanford. Remember the Sherlock Holmes thing? Oh, right, right, right. Yes. Yeah. I forgot about that. And uh, so I was like, oh, yeah, I'm here for this. Yeah, Jamal. He's, this is like, he's got like four moments in the movie that's like the same as the How Do You Like Them Apples <laughs> from Good Will Hunting. Oh, my God, it which is. I, I am always here for someone to take down a pretentious jag off by just being so much smarter than the jag off expected you to be like i know that's a bit tired too and it's also a little bit hacky if i'm being honest i am 100 percent always here for it i'm never mad at it <laughs> so i mean we were talking last night about family matters and how much i just wanted stefan to show up and show everybody <laughs> and so like and and that's sort of like an aspect of the same thing where you're just like they have an expectation of you and you're just going to blow their socks off go ahead mm-hmm. so yeah yep. i get yep. that and that the, scene with the bmw guy oh my god that was so good too right i guess you should know that since you're the one that has the lease the like, lease he says i mean <sighs> like that is uh, some you don't audacity. even own this shit I just like when he said that and he gives this guy a whole history lesson on BMW. Anybody who knows anything about cars know that this isn't just a car. Well, first of all, yes, it is, though. It is just a car. (laughs) You're not driving a car constructed from the pieces of like a World War II biplane. It is a car. You're not driving a bus. It's a car. Like, but secondly, anybody who knows anything about cars, Mm -hmm. like, so yeah. Yeah schools him on that and then it turns out this guy is working for fucking william i was getting ready to say he's awful fucking hoity-toity for somebody who's like a seems to be just like a grocery delivery person or a gopher of some kind yeah yeah because uh settle down he he's like you know part of a piece of this neighborhood that is still classic and amazing that has a famous writer that he can like separate himself from this crew of black kids playing basketball across the chain link fence. He's divorced completely from that and mm. taking advantage of something they don't even know about because why <laughs> would they kind of, you know, there's this whole like, mm-hmm. ugh, he's so gross. The delivery guy calls him Mr. Johansson. And they never explain oh, that. Right. But Jamal comments on it. He's like, Johansson. So I don't know if that is just like a a ruse that the, the delivery guy knows not to use his real name in public, you know, right. or in the hallway. Or if the delivery guy has no idea who the fuck he's delivering to. Hmm. Interesting question. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, if the guy works for just like a... I mean, we don't know what the situation is. But I'm my... my imagination says that because the kid delivers mail groceries socks right so i wonder if like no no william forrester wouldn't have a publisher 50 years after his first book so it's not that yeah like who's paying him to do this like is it is it just an agency i think probably? there are services out there for disabled people and stuff that do especially in the city you've got mm. so much more so you know okay so yeah, so yeah, it's possible this guy has no idea, yeah, you know, who that is upstairs. Hmm. Um. But yeah, that is pretty satisfying when, uh, when Jamal is the guest of the man that this guy it turns out to be working right. for. Just right. Nice little moment. <laughs> <laughs> um. When I sent you the wow wow wow, that was from the fucking standoff with Crawford. When he keeps oh. trying to start a quote. <laughs> 
It was so good. <laughs> so that was so part, good. that role of Crawford is played by F. Murray Abraham, who is Salieri. And I don't know why he always gets cast as a petty, mm. bitter, small little man. Mm-hmm. But he fucking mm-hmm. does. And he does it just so well. He nails it every time. <sighs> He's much He's better than Sean Steve's, Connery. He's Steve's favorite Jeopardy answer. If any time there's a, a category, and I've seen it a couple times, where like it's, you know, things that start with letter F. No matter what room Steve's in, he'll yell out, F. Murray Abraham! <laughs> and, and every time, that's one of the answers to one of the clues. In is it character. really? <laughs> it always oh, is. That's so funny. <laughs> what is his first name, I wonder? Franklin? Ferdinand? <laughs> Fernando? Um, Franz. Franz. Murray Abraham. Yeah, probably. <laughs> um... So yeah, let's talk about so, fucking Crawford because uh Yeah. We get an interesting tidbit into his history, and there's a line, I do love this line. What did he say? Disappointed and bitter teachers can either be very effective or very dangerous. Mm-hmm. That's what uh Forrester says to Jamal when they're talking about Crawford. Right. Who it turns out Forrester basically put the kibosh on Crawford's book. Yeah. But Crawford doesn't seem to know it. Yeah. Yeah. The so. first time that William tells the story, he's like, and they decided not to publish. It was, was the right decision. And he makes it sound as if it was simply a bad book and they mm-hmm. could tell. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But then you find out that he lied to the publishers and told them they could get first dibs on his second book, which he had no plan mm-hmm. to write at all. Yep. Yep. And just did it because he didn't want this guy publishing about him when he was the only living writer. Because the book was about how to write, even though this Mm -hmm. guy had not done that. Right. (laughs) He has some feelings on, understandably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Um, and if I remember, it it was a novel. So it's like a fictionalization, but using a living person. Was it? Oh, I didn't realize that's how it went. Okay. I think so. Um... But, yeah, Forrester was like, no, we're not doing that. Yeah. And, yeah, it's interesting, uh, like you said, that it doesn't appear that Crawford knows this at all. Doesn't seem like it. I mean, he's happily teaching the book in his class. And then when Forrester shows up later at the end, he practically comes in his pants. Mm Mm-hmm. So it doesn't seem like there's any bad. And the movie ends without that ever seeming, like, Crawford never learns that. Yeah. Which I guess is okay, because fuck him. But then the other part of me is like, oh, that's not okay. <laughs> yeah, it is a it is a nice like, oh, I'm willing to shit on other people's like work and dreams just to protect myself. Mm-hmm. Which like that's is almost that's not what really happens just... again. <laughs> like pattern of behavior is all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um. um. And yeah, that scene where he keeps on like cutting him off and telling him exactly who he's quoting. I love it. I love it so much. That is a oh, high so tension good. scene too. Like, I yeah. feel like that could have been played as so goofy. And it's sort of like what we were talking about yesterday with Umbridge, where Harry's like snapping at her and you're like, yeah, fucking tell her. But at the same time, you're like, oh, this is really right. by you. In yes. The yes. Ass. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, even Claire is like, is behind him. She's like, no, don't do it. Like, mm-hmm. don't. Don't do this. Yeah. And it's, but it's too late. It has to be done. And, you know, Crawford has it coming. You know, he deserves this fucking takedown because yeah. what has happened is Jamal has really seemingly integrated into this new environment pretty well, you right. know? And he's doing really well academically in his classes. And this is a question because he was a C student in his public school. Right. Now, these teachers are being really, I think, obtuse. And maybe it's just because it's poorly written. Or just because Crawford has an attitude. I'm not 100% sure. But it makes sense to me that if you take a Jamal and put him in an environment where excelling doesn't make him an outsider, Mm -hmm. then there's nothing holding him back. Right. 
right? So I wasn't surprised that he, because they're they're all like, this curriculum is so difficult, and you seem to be really improving really rapidly. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, he was functioning at 50%. Right. You know, now he's free to give it 100. Of course, he's going to do so much better. But instead, we get a suspicious and cynical Crawford Mm -hmm. who thinks that he's just doing too well too soon Mm -hmm. considering his background yeah i like that phrasing mm -hmm. so yeah i don't know i mean i guess the movie needs a antagonist right you gotta have a bad guy Mm -hmm. i guess crawford works as well as any other one would have but i wasn't a hundred hundred percent sure that felt right you know hmm. i don't know i i really could understand i i feel like it feels right with the understanding of how crawford has tried to succeed and hasn't mm. when what really triggers the whole thing is uh is jamal handing in a piece of writing that's truly outstanding but he did it based on a piece that um we find out later william had published right. Right. Well, and he turns in something of his own first. Oh, so it's the and second thing that he gets yeah, nailed on. The second okay. thing that he puts, the second thing he, he does the one paper and it's really well, but we don't know what it's about. Right. And then Crawford makes Jamal come into his office to write future pa- papers to make sure that, you know. Right. And he does that whole thing. And then for the writing competition, Jamal turns in the seasons of the whatever it was called right and yeah and that's when he gets busted um so yeah i could really see like him just being so angry that somebody so young who comes from a Mm. background that he doesn't feel has like he hasn't been steeped in this kind of world like i have Mm -hmm. and how can he Mm -hmm. come in here and just spit this out um that feels like something that's true to human nature right. to me and f- yeah, just pursuing right. it to, for the sake of just taking this one kid down. Like, yeah. you know, I don't know. I really, yeah, I, I, there are so many people out there that just can't like cope with someone <laughs> having a natural talent when yeah, they've worked really hard. Right. It really is Salieri all over again. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think you might be right, especially considering what he says about how teachers that are bitter and disappointed can be very dangerous. Mm -hmm. I think I have uh, a little bit of a blind spot, you know, when it comes to teachers, which is unfortunate. Mm. Um, Yeah. So, yeah, I think you're right. If he's someone who is, I mean, what does, what does forster say about crawford he wrote one book and then he never tried again Mm, he just went to become a teacher and that's part like when uh later on jamal says something like you think if i was a white kid that he or he says if i was a two comma kid two comma kid which i never heard that phrase before but i like that (laughs) um he was like if i was one of these two comma kids you think that he would be talking about considering your background and I liked that because I think that really is a key, even though it's all dog whistles, mm-hmm. that the fact that of who Jamal is and where he comes from is right. the key element here to how bitter and angry Crawford is to him specifically. Because I feel like if this were a white kid turning in outstanding work, he would adopt him in a sort of way and be like trying to ride the coattails of a kid mm. that has probably an influential family and, you know, sort of try to claim some partial credit for inspiring right. this kid. Even if, you know what, if it, say it were another scholarship kid, but maybe just white. Mm-hmm. I think then, then Crawford would have been, like you said, he would have taken the kid on as like a pet almost. Right. You know, look, th- look at this young raw talent that I discovered, mm-hmm. you know, and he's going to do great things and I'm going to under my tutelage, you know, but he doesn't have that reaction to Jamal mm-hmm. and, uh, which is a bummer. Cause you know, he could have, yeah, <laughs> but no. And I think, I think you're right where it has to do with 
raw talent at such a young age. Um, hmm. I think he really genuinely thinks Jamal didn't do this, too. I don't even think it's like, oh, I'm so jealous of this kid. I really think he doesn't believe that he's capable of it. Yeah. You know, in yeah. a, which is a whole other thing. Um, well, that's the worst thing, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know. Um, so I did, I did like some of the scenes with them in the apartment writing together. Mm -hmm. Um, even though again, Connery was a little like, I don't know who he was channeling, (laughs) you know, as, as far as like, you know, you know, the stereotypes of, you know, angry, sullen writers. There's a lot of like Salinger. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. You know, thing going on here. One book, one great book disappears, and, you know, into becoming a recluse, and the world is always wondering what he could have done. Mm-hmm. Why did he disappear? You know, he's a little bit of a piece of shit, too, BT dubs. Salander? Oh, yeah. <laughs> mm. I still haven't read anything of his. You haven't read Catch on a Rhyme? Mm-mm. I have read, read portions um, of it and got infuriated and was like, yeah, this is not for me. Yeah, it's a really. It's a, it's, it's something. It's really something. I read it when I was very, very young. I think I read it in, I want to say I was in the seventh grade, sixth or seventh grade. Um, and I liked it. Mm-hmm. I didn't understand it though. Yeah. But I liked it well enough. And then I read it, you know, a couple more times as I got older and it is, um, it's something. Yeah. <laughs> um, Oh, and you know what? I wanted to mention about the the scene where Crawford, he embarrasses him and, you know, replies to all of the quotes that he's quoting. It starts off with Crawford humiliating this kid named Coleman for no In the class? good reason. Yeah. Oh, Coleridge? Coleridge. That's right. That's right. Or Coolidge, something like that. Um, And I really like the fact that it's sort of the movie has decided to set it up that rather than doing this because Crawford came after him, Jamal is, is like this, like defending this kid in a way. Right. You know, like, um, he, he, he knows you, uh, seem like a halfway decent guy. You like approached me about how to handle this dude. Um, when he tried to sort of come at me, like on my first week Mm -hmm. and, there's something really because I feel like the trope is often black kid gets bullied in in a white environment and some nice white kid decides to like take up mm-hmm. the cause and like right. adopt him and protect him. And instead we've got Jamal being like, all right, obviously your mental faculties are not enough to like deal with Crawford because he is just <laughs> such a shit. So I am going to step in here for a second and just embarrass him so much. Yeah. Yeah. And I really like that aspect of it too that it's yeah. like you know he's just doing this because like what the fuck was that dude and exactly. in the end i love that it's and it starts because jamal just tries to give him the answer mm-hmm. you know he's just like just say your name just say your name mm-hmm. and the kid is like what and then the teacher <laughs> he's so you know dumb. and, I, oh, this poor kid. and um but he fucking he owns him in this moment yeah or as they as he said in the movie when he was playing basketball he sunned him <laughs> oh yeah I forgot about that. I'd never heard that. Um, no, yeah, it's they don't. People don't say it a lot anymore. But yeah, it used to be kind of a thing. Um, they should bring it back. <laughs> yeah, I kind of like that. Mm, um, he got sunned. <laughs> yeah, it's like kind of a a more um, emphatic way than like I'm going to make you my bitch, which has like a whole, real whole ugly bunch of uh, baggage. Exactly. Along with it. Exactly. It's a it's a way to get across that same sentiment without being like misogynistic yeah. or homophobic, homophobic. or you know, yeah. or or rapey. Mm. It's just that or expression, that. you know, I'm gonna make you my bitch is all of those things. Um so so yeah, so that was like he's already been accused of not being good enough to write the paper. Right. Then he has this exchange with Crawford and that's really like what puts a nail in his coffin for right. what ends up happening. Um, what did you think of the basketball game? That shit was tense. Oh man, that was really <laughs> tough because like right before 
It turns out that um, Claire's dad is on the board, and he's the one who changed the rules so that it's no longer an all-boys school so that she could go to the school. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he's got plenty of power. Obviously, the the place in which they were having that after party from the first game is her mm-hmm. home. Like, mm-hmm. he looks like a fucking, like, Batman villain. Um, really did. <laughs> you know, he looks and like I a thought Green Goblin. He, I thought that actor was someone else. I thought he was, like, um, the fuck is his name? He always plays the... the is it Eric Roberts that I thought it was for a second? I'm trying to find he, him. He looked like here. someone that's sort of famous. But then I was looking at the credits and I was like, oh, that wasn't him at all. Michael Norrie, Dr. Spence. Yeah. yeah. What, is it, what else has he been in? Oh, okay. Yeah. Because this guy looks a little bit like two different actors. So I kind of get him mixed up. But yeah. Um, let's see. I'm looking at. So oh, he's been in a lot. Like even in just the past five years. He was on Law and Order, Crash. Um, all these things, damages, all my children, a bunch of all my children. Um, oh, body oh, flash dance. Oh shit. He was the, like, Oh, wow. blue bloods. Um, he's been in a lot of television. It looks like that's yeah. mostly what he's he does. got like a face that you see everywhere. Yeah. But, um, so what were we talking about? Before um, I, I was saying corrected. before he go before the game, her father approaches him and tells him, we're not going to pursue this, but because they want him to stay as a player because he wins games. Yeah. And yeah, they're like, yeah. so in exchange for us not pursuing this and giving you a less rigorous academic How schedule. How about that less rigorous shit? Yeah. Because they think he can't keep up and that he's plagiarizing because he can't mm-hmm. do it. They, But if you keep playing games... We'll be able to, you know, work this whole thing out and it'll be beneficial for both of us. We just mm-hmm. want what's best for you. And yeah. it's so patronizing. And it's one of those things that I think about what I would have thought when I was watching this the first time. And I don't think I would have understood because to me, listen, we'll still give you the scholarship and you still get to play basketball, which you clearly enjoy and you will have to do less schoolwork. What's the downside? Sounds good, right? Right. <laughs> but like, you know, the the implication is just so insulting and so underestimating mm-hmm. him and so like, mm-hmm. we're going to get out of you what we can. Yep. So he goes out on that fucking court and just throws us. it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I kind of like um, knew he was gonna do it, but I was like, "Don't do it, kid. Just don't do it." But at the same <laughs> time, I'm like, "I get it." And I'm not sure if the movie, like, I thought it was clear that he missed on purpose. Mm-hmm. But they have a moment where they have Farster ask him, "Did you miss or did you miss?" Right, and he doesn't answer. He just says, "That's that's not a soup question." Yeah. Um. So I don't know if the movie was trying to make that sort of ambiguous and we were all supposed to come to our own conclusions or if it was supposed to be like we all understood that he missed on purpose and why he did it. I think it was meant to be that we understood because we were like right there, but he was watching on the TV and he didn't know what happened beforehand. So he doesn't get why that would have happened. Do you hear that? I keep having this like beeping happen in my office but it's happening like once every two hours and i can't figure out where it's coming from did you hear that no uh, i didn't hear it me nuts i don't know what to make of it um because it's over too fast for me to follow the sound to its source and there's like a billion <laughs> electronics in this room it could be fucking anything um, maybe uh you have a fire a smoke detector the battery is dying and it's letting you know if you if i could turn this you could see behind me the uh smoke detector hanging from the ceiling oh my god it's not the smoke detector is it (laughs) because it would not shut the fuck up and it's wired directly into the mainframe of like the electricity for the house that's how ours is too Mm -mm, i actually also have one that's hanging like that for wires in my house like (laughs) you guys can't make it so that even if i light a candle it goes off that's just anyway (laughs) Um, so yeah, I thought it was supposed to be that we knew and other people just didn't have the context for it. Okay. But yeah, that Um, game was, it was hard because his brother and mom are there. Yeah. Uh, And you're just like, don't let them down. (laughs) He looked 
you know, I don't like he really looked like he was really sweating it out. But I think it wasn't that he was sweating the shot like the audience would have thought or the you know spectators would have thought. He was sweating the decision. Mm-hmm. You know 100% what I mean? agree. Like he was like, which way? Because they had a they they made sure to include the, him and that Malfoy esque character whose name I don't recall. Have that either. standoff where they do like fifty free throws in a row, right? right. It's, a, it's punishment, but it's, it's a punishment that turns into sort of like a, a spectacle. Like we can't believe, you know. Uh, so we know he can make that fucking shot. Mm-hmm. But he is taking his sweet time, deciding. I guess does does he want to give these people what they want? Yeah, you know why should I bring them a trophy? Mm-hmm. Fuck them. <laughs> yep. Especially the like way that um, Claire phrases it. Oh yeah, we always have this party so they can celebrate their victory. Mm-hmm. And she mm-hmm. says it like she's just Claire fucking knows she gets it, man. <laughs> she- yeah, she is like over her family. Yep. And over her school. She's over all their bullshit. <laughs> um and I cannot express how appreciative I am that we did not turn this into a also teen angst love affair. Mhm. Agreed. Because I just didn't care about it. And it's one of the things I like least about Goodwill Hunting also. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> And I thought that they were going to have, when they jump ahead and it's like senior year, she was going to pop up and be his girlfriend. And we would see that like everything had worked out and her dad was fine with it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But she's nowhere to be seen in the end there. Like she's just not a factor, which on the one hand is a bummer because I liked her and I kind of feel Mm -hmm. like they would have been good together. But on the other hand, I, I like that it didn't decide to make any sort of statement either way about that and let it that's, be about him and that's it you know it didn't exactly it, it didn't center her um because if that happens if the movie tries to deal with that relationship then it can't help but put her kind of in the middle and it becomes less about jamal and more about claire's and her family and whether her father is bigoted or not and whether her father comes around or not you know yeah I don't really care about all that. Yeah. So, I mean, for all we know, they were a couple in the senior year. And it just, you know, it was not an integral part of the story that they were trying to tell. I'm glad they choose they chose to focus. Yeah. And I feel like showing her as being with him would have been like, see, everything worked out and she's the prize. And they yeah. also didn't do that, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. The, I think that was just an overall good move. Um, mm-hmm. But I did kind of want to see her again and the fact that he like yeah. so boldly rejected her the way he did really surprised <laughs> me i was like damn all right i guess that's it yeah. i was uh i was pleased at the end where they're at the writing comp the writing competition sort of day and she comes and sits next to him and she puts her, like her she takes she takes his hand mm-hmm. and he takes hers and that's that's all it's all it was it was not a whole you know that was it but yeah I thought I was like, oh, that's a really nice way to handle that, you mm-hmm. know. That they are still friends, and if something should happen in the future, that's that's great, right? But that's not the story we're telling right now. So, tell me about the scene that made you go, oh, okay, this went in a direction, a different direction than I thought. So good, you texted me um, when he after the game. Because I, before we get to that moment, I didn't know which way we was going to go either. And I wasn't sure if he was going to be able to stay at school or not. And I didn't expect Farster to come in the way he did. I thought that, um, I thought that Jamal would refuse to write the apology letter. Mm-hmm. That he would, I guess, not be asked to stay at the school. Hmm. And that um, what would happen with Forrester is that he he wouldn't be able to overcome whatever is going on with him. I, I don't know if he's agoraphobic or whatever exactly that is. Right. Um, that he wouldn't be able to come out and vouch for Jamal. Um, so, yeah, I, I was surprised. 
Okay. Yeah, I just I just thought it was going to end on a. I thought it was going to end up with Jamal like back at his old school, and um, it being kind of like well, it doesn't matter that you you didn't succeed at this fancy pants school because you're such a good writer you're going to be great regardless, which is not uh, a terrible story. You know gotcha. that's fine too, mm-hmm. but I thought it really was going to have be a thing where he wasn't going to be allowed to have both because mm-hmm. in these move types of movies you usually aren't. And this movie ends with him still at the school, still doing well, being scouted by apparently lots of colleges to yeah. the point that he thinks when Matt, Matt Damon fucking shows up in this movie. Right. Um, I was like, when I, I realized it was him and I was like, what are you, this is like a three minute scene. Yep. Um, and he's been visited by so many recruiters that when he gets told someone's downstairs, the assumption is, oh, it's just another one. Yeah. So this movie ends with him getting just about everything that he deserves, I think. Mm-hmm. And it's just so rare. <laughs> That's fair. You yeah. Know? It's just rare. Yeah. So it comes down to, as you said, William being willing to put himself on the line and deal with his fear mm-hmm. for the sake of somebody that he, you know, he had one of the best nights in recent memory going mm-hmm. out even though he had that panic attack at yep, Madison yep, Square Garden yep. then later on they go to uh the empty um Yankee Stadium right and he that's where he like kind of breaks down and tells Jamal about what happened with his brother yeah yeah and we um it's it's a really sad story you know of mm-hmm. course it is um, and it's after he's a famous writer, you know, his book is already out and he's got this brother that's come home from, I'm going to, from the war, I guess, Vietnam war time yeah. seems about right. And his brother comes home and he's, you know, he's fucked up from the war and he ends up drinking and driving and, uh, and dying. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it turns out that William has let him, let him go, let him drive away. And then he tells us that. Within five months, both his mother and his father were also gone. So he mm-hmm. lost, like, his whole family in, like, a blink of an eye. Yeah. And Jamal and- is like, well, why did you stop going outside? And he says something like, I don't know. I lost track of time. I don't know when it happened. <laughs> and I like, too, this, like, side bit where he's in the fucking hospital dealing with his mm. brother who just died. And a nurse yeah. is telling him how important his book was to her. And he's just yeah. like... Now is not That's the right. fucking time. What is wrong with you? Like That's right. Just making it about her in this moment where he's dealing mm-hmm. like with the worst loss of his life so far right. and just yeah. being disgusted with how everybody is taking something that he wrote and making it about them, which mm-hmm. I know is something that a lot of artists deal with because you have to eventually put your work out there if you want to make a living. And once right. you do, you have to sort of let go of what happens. Yep. And Once it's out there, it's like it's not yours anymore. Yeah, and, um, I imagine that is. Ooh, where is that? Where did that sun come from? Good lord! Oh yeah, all of a sudden you're all lit up. <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> <laughs> I feel so exposed. What the fuck? <laughs> um, I just wait, I'm waiting for you to hiss at it. <laughs> oh my! <laughs> Uh, All right. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so he comes out and he reads this whole thing at the, uh, because I love this too. The kids write that it's a, you know, writing contest and they come out and they do their whole, um, their public reading of the piece that they wrote, yeah, which I terrible. think rightfully William is like, why would they, that's fucking what we write right, for so that right. somebody else can read it. <laughs> what are we doing the reading for too? That's not our job. Like, and uh, <laughs> I do really agree with that, especially when the tail end of the student reading that we get is like kind of oh, painful. This kid is the worst. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he comes in, sweeps in with his fucking mm. uh, yeah. That's my picture on the wall there of like oh my you know fucking motherfuckers. You all can't touch. That's me. <laughs> and then 
He's like, do you all mind if I say a few words? And he waits for a response, but he didn't mm-hmm. have to. He could have just gone up. And it's like if I was doing a podcast and Beyonce walked in and was like, do you mind if I take the mic for a second? Like, <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what am I going to say? <laughs> um, and reads this thing that everybody obviously finds very moving. We only hear like mm-hmm. a piece of it. Oh, my God. You know what? Yeah, they don't. I mean, I guess they were like, we're not going to be bothered trying to write something this this phenomenal. Yeah. Instead, we're just going to do a close up of everybody's face and show you how moved they are and put some mm-hmm. really sappy music on. And, you know, that's that's going to stand in for us actually writing something that would be moving, which I feel like is a better move because so much of the time. Like shows will be like this. He's an, an amazing artist, and then they'll show you a piece of his work, and you're like, uh huh. Um, that's like at the end of uh, the second season of of Daredevil, where me and Maggie just tore apart this article that's supposed to be like this life changing piece of writing that was <laughs> so bad it was terrible like even just for they television the whole standards ar- the whole article yeah she's reading her like it's it's the reporter narrating her article over these fine like ending scenes of the oh, season okay and it is the most cliched shit even for a like superhero television show it's really <laughs> bad so I think it was a, a smart move on their part yeah. to just sort of fade out from there and just <laughs> you fill in the blanks. It was amazing. Just we promise. <laughs> Trust us. Yeah. Look you at know. the tears in the corners of everyone's eyes. <laughs> and um, it turns out that he's reading a letter that uh, that Jamal wrote to him after the, the basketball game. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Jamal's brother found it. And went and brought it to William very presumptuously. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's not like it was in a corner somewhere and they hadn't spoken for two months. And his brother was like, oh, I'm going to finally forge a reconnection between them. As far as he knows, everything's fine and he's going to deliver this to his friend tomorrow. (laughs) You know, but like. Also, yeah, like, because there seems to be like a sense of urgency for Terrence to get this letter to William. But Terrence, I don't think knows about what's going on at the school Mm -mm. and i we don't get didn't get to hear the letter but i'm i'm assuming the letter also didn't like ask william to come to the school you know no yeah so i'm not sure why terrence thought it was so important but but it was because what happens is the next morning jamal goes to school we don't know if he even notices the letter is gone because it's not addressed at all. Yeah, that was my main thing was like, I would have been like, where the fuck did that go? I'd be late yeah. to school trying to find it. You know, yeah. it was clearly labeled. It was right on my <laughs> desk. Like, <laughs> what the fuck? So, and I don't know. And again, we don't know what's in the letter. So I guess what we're supposed to assume is that the letter was so moving that William read it and it gave him the courage or showed him how important it was for him to go and stand up and be there for Jamal, mm-hmm. whatever was in this, whatever what he wrote. Um, okay. Which seems surprising given that William, William is currently a little bit on Jamal's shit list, but apparently yes. he wrote this like really flattering letter about how like sometimes you can just make someone your blood because you look up to them that much. And I'm yeah, like, I, yeah, that's what's like, right. I don't know if, like, Jamal has written this letter after he, through this game, he's got to be, I feel like, uncertain about what his future is. Mm-hmm. Um, you know what? I wish they had let us read that fucking letter. I'm so curious now. I want to know, like, because I'm, I'm thinking that what has won William over is just Jamal's talent. Like, it's Mm -hmm. not that what he said was so flattering. It's just that whatever it is that he wrote was so well written Mm -hmm. that William is like, oh, no, I got to go tell these people that, you know, this kid is had my permission. He didn't steal it from me and whatever. I can't let this kid go down in flames. (laughs) Cat. (laughs) The cat, the sun, it's mayhem over there. (laughs) It is. Um, yeah, and I think that probably that was like a goodbye letter 
that Jamal was probably disappointed enough. And so he just wrote him a letter that was like, I learned a lot from you. And even though you are not going to like have my back on this thing, I'm going to just appreciate what I learned and, and try and like use that and move on. And I think that might be part of it too, is like Mm. William realizing that Jamal is basically letting himself get penalized rather than outing William Mm -hmm. and sort of like, even though that's what he was initially asking him to do once the kid's like, fine, he's like, wait, you can't do that. You're Mm -hmm. ruining your future. Like, but I find it really interesting. Like the whole, the whole setup of Jamal handing in this letter that, or this um, assignment that starts off with a piece of writing he didn't know William had published in the New Yorker Mm -hmm. years before. It's set up that William specifically says nothing that we write in this apartment leaves this apartment. Right. And when they have this like moment of Jamal explaining to him what happened and how they're trying to hold that over his head, William's of course response is like, I told you not to take anything out. And Jamal very rightfully is like, or you could have just said, this shit has been published, Jamal. <laughs> How about you just tell me what the fuck is going on instead mm-hmm. of being cryptic and having these rules mm. like we're in some kind of fairy tale and I don't stray off the path. <laughs> and she's straight off the path and whatever she gets is what she gets for not following the rules. Mm-hmm. This isn't a fairy tale. You could use your words. We've been hanging out all the time. Right. Just right. talk about what you want me to do. <laughs> Like, this isn't hard. So I mm-hmm. like that there isn't Jamal just being like, fine, I guess I did go ag- right. like, break your confidence. It's right. him being like, you're being ridiculous and yeah. overdramatic and acting like we're in a story. This is my <laughs> life right now, dude. Right. And he's Jamal is like, I, I fucking wrote that. Like, that shit is mine. I, you know, if I want to fucking take it and show someone what I can do, I'm going to do that. Mm-hmm. And um, I agree 100%. Yeah, you know, same. Especially because it's it's something he's going to turn into Crawford, who has been really needling him and yeah. being a pain in the dick. Mm-hmm. So, you know, yeah, the, the movie framed it kind of like Jamal acted rashly. You know, he just takes the paper in a fit of like, you know, I'll show them. Mm-hmm. And goes against William's rules. But I do, I don't think he was wrong to do it. I, don't, no, I think the movie either. wanted us to meet kind of like, oh, he shouldn't have done that. You know, he agreed not to take anything out. But, um, yeah. And I don't think it was wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the only thing that Crawford really has is that the title's the same. Right? And the first, like, paragraph-ish. Paragraph-ish. Okay. So yeah. that's all they need to be like, well, this is obviously not yours. And I'm like, well, where's the rest yeah. of it coming from? It's, like, It's so weird, though, because they acknowledge it. At one point, one of them, if not Crawford, the other dean, says it's clear that you took it in a different original story, but mm-hmm. that title in that first paragraph is not yours. Right. Um, they say almost the exact same thing that William says when he first reads it. Mm-hmm. When he tells Jamal that, you know, you've really made this, made this yours. Mm-hmm. So I don't know about the, the rules for plagiarism. I don't know if it's like a zero tolerance policy. It probably varies by schools, you know. At one point mm-hmm. in the disciplinary committee, they're like, if you can prove you got permission to mm-hmm. use the title and the intro, then, you know, everything is cool. Right. But I'm like, it's still plagiarism though, isn't it? Mm. Like if you say you use something that's not yours, I mean, maybe not plagiarism, but it's still using something that's not yours, even if someone gave you permission to use it. And they do give him an opportunity. They say like, we like to, with all students, they make sure to like, say it like that, give them an opportunity to credit someone who may have inspired them. Do you want to do that? And he Mm -hmm. says no. And I'm like... You could have just handled it right there and been like, look, I found this piece of writing. It, I used it as a jumping off point and that is what happened. Because obviously from the way they're framing their questions, they already know. But he doesn't do that either. And I'm like, all right. Dude. <laughs> well, if he says um, that, 
if he cops to it right then, then it's a wrap. It's a done deal. Because it's still, in their eyes, plagiarism. Only he's just copped to it at the beginning, you know. But I feel like the way they worded it, they were trying to give him an out because they want to keep him as a student. Um, so the way that they were like, we try and like ask students if there's anyone they would like to credit. Mm-hmm. It, like they're, it, it's like they're trying to make it easier for him because they don't want to kick him out because um, of the team. You know what I mean? And right. he is refusing to do that. I think I, I, I like get why not. Um, and I think that he is doing it in that moment for similar reasons as to throwing the game later because he can sense that they don't want to hold him responsible. And he feels like, oh, really? Interesting. You are mm. you do this with all your students, do you? Mm. And I think that he feels this is them admitting, well, we bet that you probably didn't write this. But we're but giving you an out. But if we can come up with a story together, huh. it'll be fine. You know what I mean? Yeah. That was what I got, but I could be wrong about it. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting take. I thought it was... Like I hadn't, it didn't occur to me to think of it as it being a special offer to him. Um, but yeah, I mean, if it is, if they don't, in fact, give every kid an opportunity to be like, well, what had happened was, mm-hmm. um, and they really are treating him differently because they want him to win basketball games for them. And the more I talk about the school, the less I like them. Yeah, same. Yeah. I mean, th- there's no escaping that having that name on your ad- application, the name of the school is going to be like advantageous, right. but there's definitely, I mean, and and you kind of go both directions here where th- when they say, th- as soon as they say, we give every student the opportunity, I'm like, do you? <laughs> but I bet they do with like really rich kids or influential kids, like, you know, for Claire, for example, I think they would, mm-hmm. her dad's on the board. Um and hmm. there is a huge history of kids that are really good at sports being let fail classes, oh, essentially, God, yeah. so that they can yeah. keep playing. So, yeah. I don't well, know. Also, I guess I'm just really remember, suspicious overall. Part of the deal that they're trying to offer him is that he writes and reads an apology letter in front of Crawford's right. class. Right. 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 So... If this is a deal they give all the kids, like, especially if they're athletes or someone that they want to, you know, on the team, or if they're the kid of somebody who's really privileged and important, they're willing to let it slide, but Crawford needs to get his fucking revenge one up. or satisfaction, one-up spin or whatever, yeah. um, which I feel like is very specific to Jamal, you know, um, You know, if a normal kid, it just gets caught plagiarizing. I don't know if Crawford needs that, uh, a personal apology, Mm -hmm. but, and there's that really weird scene where he leans over and says, don't ever embarrass me in front of my class again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, you kind of embarrassed yourself though, didn't you? He did. Like, honestly, there were a million ways he could have handled that whole thing. But just ending with get out yeah. is so is copping so completely to the fact that you're that you failed at trying to mm-hmm. publicly humiliate a student, which is really mm-hmm. low. You know, just like em- yeah. you should be embarrassed. Ugh. Yeah. He could have just stopped trying to quote shit and just turn back around and finish teaching. <laughs> you know, like. So. All right. So, yeah, he. uh he, when William comes in and he reads this whole thing, of course, he, like, starts to just leave because he is such a fucking snob that he knows the first thing Crawford's going to do is follow after him and be like, but why are you here? Your <laughs> words were amazing. Like, he doesn't start to be – he doesn't finish his reading and right. then go, that was written by Jamal. No, no. He waits for them to queen. fucking – oh, my God. <laughs> Like, and then they all start clapping again, and Crawford is trying to, like, shush them. <laughs> it's like, what is, what is happening? <laughs> yep. And then Crawford tries to be like, well, you have to understand that despite these revelations, it will not at all affect the right. end judgment. Mm-hmm. And w- are you really willing in the, in the, like, in front of this audience of, like, 200 people to admit that you're going to hold this kid back 
even though we all now know Mm -hmm. it wasn't what you thought? Yep. Are you going to cop to that in front of everybody and let them all know how fucking petty you are? Yeah, he was. He 100% was. um, Luckily for him, his, you know, colleague came over and was like, you have to sit down now. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Because, yeah, he was so vindictive that he really thought that he was going to, like, not have to consider this new information which is i believe the information they asked for at the beginning which was if did you have permission to use these words yep um mm -hmm. f murray Mm -hmm. abraham i'll tell you what yeah f you (laughs) (laughs) f f murray abraham (laughs) so um it fast forwards and uh there's, well, before it fast forwards, they're outside of the, you know, the writing contest, and William announces that he is going to go to Scotland. Mm-hmm. So we have a man who was not leaving his house, and now we have a man who is going to a whole other country. Right. And um, then it fast forwards to the senior year, and we see. A Can very, I just uh, talk about uh, him riding away on his bike listen. in the middle of the fucking traffic? It gave me so okay. much anxiety. I liked his little hand signals that he was using. Oh my god, I do, especially in the, <laughs> when he first comes out and it, mm-hmm. there's nobody on the road. Yeah, and he's yeah. still doing it. Like, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking when I was watching that was, do people do that anymore? Because, you know, people bike all over Philly. Yeah. You know, I see them all the time. I, I cannot remember the last time I saw somebody do that. I don't, I mean, they probably should still be doing it. I've seen one or two people, like, when I was driving. Yeah. And they were, like, letting me know because I was behind them. But uh, Gabby's here and says she wants your headphones. <laughs> Hi, Gabby. Me too. <laughs> um. But yeah, I, I, so I've seen some people do that, but I feel like they do it when they're concerned, <laughs> when they're like, you're a little close or this right that I'm about to take is a little sudden. I'm just, I don't just so you fucking attention. know, okay? I'm just going to start yeah. flailing wildly and call it a hand signal. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I'm sorry I interrupted you, but no, so we was, jump ahead. it was a good interruption because you're right. That was pretty funny. Um. <laughs> Like, his bike, when he first pulls it out, it's got, like, a, a flat tire. He hasn't been on that fucking thing in years. Yep. <laughs> but, um, so, we fast forward to senior year. We have what seems like a very well-adjusted Jamal getting along well with his classmates, doing well in school. Uh, he's, he's got a friends visitor. with Coleridge. <laughs> Him and then they're, like, hanging out now. He says, word to Coleridge. <laughs> Coleridge may have said it back. I don't know. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. Uh, And Matt Damon is bringing sad news that uh, Forrester has passed away. Right. And we find out he had been sick for several years. So he was sick the whole time that he was hanging out with Jamal and just never said anything. Mm -hmm. And he has left Jamal um, his apartment, Mm -hmm. which is, wow. (laughs) Right. Wow. His like sixteen bedroom fucking apartment. Mm-hmm. It looks like that thing is huge. Um, all the contents therein. Most importantly, a manuscript for a mm-hmm. second book, with uh, instructions that Jamal is to write the forward. So holy shit, there. Mm-hmm. I can't imagine the proceeds must also go to. I mean, he's basically fucking set them up. Yep. Like, I don't, I don't think we're supposed to focus on the, the financial impact of what he has done. You because know, I don't think that was, like, the point of the movie. But listen, I'm poor. I'm always going to focus on the financial impact of shit. And he mm-hmm. left him a giant-ass apartment, a novel, a novel that publishers will be clamoring to pay to publish. And, um... The bidding really war. Letter. Oh, boy. I wish we got oh. to see that. Wait, what? The oh, bidding, the bidding war? war? Oh, God. Yeah. Can you ima- so, and, um, plus the setup for him to write the forward is like launching him into literary spaces, you know, and giving him a chance to sh- Oh, my God. Yeah. But, but there's also a very sweet letter that says basically to Jamal that if he had not come into William's life, he probably would not have ever left. Mm-hmm. You know, 
Um, he would have taken time he didn't have to make this choice to go on this trip to go home. Um, and I thought that was really sweet. Yeah, agreed. He's just, it, it was essentially like better late than never. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I'm, I was in the winter of my life, but yeah. I, this would not have happened. And I do like it too, that there's a, a one scene that I thought was going to end with like him catching Jamal and being like, what are you doing? But Jamal's looking through that photo album. Yeah. Yeah. I and there's no like big blowout over yeah. it at all. It's just him being like, oh, wow, you had a yeah. life and kids yep. like you were a kid. I- I thought it was going to be the same thing, like, you know, because I knew that there was going to be some kind of friction in their relationship because there kind of has to be. There has to be something. So mm-hmm. um, it turned out to be him taking the paper, which Jamal, as we just said, wasn't even 100 percent wrong on that. But, mm-hmm. yeah, when he's snooping and he goes to the photo album, I was like, oh, this is it. He's going to come storming into the room and snatch it out of his hands and tell him he's got no business. This doesn't concern you, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that didn't happen at all. <laughs> nope. Yeah, instead it's just him like getting a peek into into this like whole man's this man's whole other life that he lived that he's mm-hmm. obviously left behind for some reason and just lets his stuff get delivered and like I like too when he has that panic attack and Jamal finds him. Mm-hmm. He's like you didn't you used to be out. What happened? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And his response is how the fuck do I know? Yeah. Which, uh, you know, like, fair. Mental yeah. illness can be like that. Phobias can be like that, where you're just like, this didn't used to fuck me up like this. What yeah, now, happened? Yeah, that's exactly how it can be. Yep. And um, I like, too, that William says, I'm sorry I lost you. Not William. Jamal says, I'm sorry I lost you. <laughs> yeah. Like, there were just some moments that, like, he didn't. Like, Jamal didn't get all, like, sketched out. Like, he found a grown man basically cowering under, I don't know what it was. It was a weird, like, utility crawl space or something, you know, mm-hmm. hiding from the crowd. And he didn't react with callousness, you know. He was, like, really gentle and compassionate, mm-hmm. um, which for a 16-year-old boy, you know. Especially because he had just been saying, I paid actual money for these tickets. Let's go. Mm-hmm. So his first thing that he says is, let's get you out of here. He's yep. not trying to be like, are you okay? You want to go inside? He's like, yep. no, we need to leave. Yeah. Like- <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, takes him to the stadium or the ballpark, mm-hmm. which, you know, was just really Jamal. I just like Jamal. Yeah. He a good I do. Boy. I like this character a lot. Yeah. Agreed. Um, all right. Is there anything else you wanted to mention? No, I'm. I, I think um, we covered it. I I'm glad that I had a chance to watch it. You know, it was surprising. Like I said, it's not like a, you know, a masterpiece or anything. You know, mm-hmm. but I really enjoyed this character. I really enjoyed this actor. Um, yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad I watched it. Yay! <laughs> you too. Yeah, this is not something I I would ever have thought to revisit. So uh, yeah. thank you to Anonymous for commissioning this. When because yeah. when I got the email, it was like, oh yeah, this is what I'm. I was like, Finding Forrester, really? <laughs> like even the title sounds so like goofy and and kind of. It sounds like a, a the mov- a movie title that they would have used in Seinfeld. It does a little bit. Do you know what Diagnosis I mean? Like negative. Yeah. <laughs> Or is it prognosis negative? I think it's prognosis. Uh, prognosis negative. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> and or in uh, Sex in the City, there's one that's called like uh, M- M- Mor- Maury's Room or some. There's some movie that they talk about all the time that's just like Maury's Room. I don't room. remember. And then the Seinfeld what this ones. Sounds like. I know. There's like a you know Rochelle Rochelle. Oh right. The young girl's erotic journey from Milan to Minsk. <laughs> there's um paper sack. Which is the one where it's like the family with their heads are sticking out of the paper sack. Lane doesn't want to go see. Oh, sack lunch. Sack lunch. That's what it is. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, Uh, man. That's really good. I forgot about that one. I'm trying to see who did this movie. Um, Gus Van Zandt? Oh, really? Who is he? He's somebody. Um, Yeah. I feel like he did a movie with... uh, Um. Is it Jean Claude Van Damme, or it's the guy that I always confuse with Jean Claude Van Damme? Um, I, do you know how that is? You have, mm-hmm. do you have actors like that that you always think that they're a different person? Oh yeah. So he Plenty. did. Um, 
Oh, he TV did. shows Portlandia. Drugstore Cowboy. That's my shit. Have you ever seen that? No. Oh, Milk. Love- oh, he did Milk. Oh, he did Goodwill Goodwill Hunting. He did what Goodwill Hunting. Well, God oh, damn. he has. Okay, there, there you there go. It is. And then, because I was thinking to myself, why is Matt Damon in this movie? There's got to be a connection. There you go. Yeah, you're right. Oh, he That's did funny. my own private, uh, my own private Idaho. Never heard of that oh, either. See, wait, Keanu Reeves and fucking River Phoenix? Is it River Phoenix? Nope. Is it River Phoenix, guys? Or is it um Brad Pitt? I think it's River Phoenix and Keanu Reeves. Oh, God. even cowgirls get the blues. I've heard of that one. Um, yeah, wow, he's done. He's done quite a bit. I'm looking yeah, at all these has. different ones, but there's a lot I've never heard of. Quite prolific. Hmm. Yeah. Well, you know what? That I think explains a little bit about how they went in so many different ways with this movie. When you see yeah. who's who's behind it, interesting. We got to watch Drugstore Cowboy. No, okay. we don't have to do it for anything, but we have to watch it. <laughs> uh, what was it you were asking me if I saw Dog Day Afternoon? On yeah, Facebook. We need to watch that yeah. too. Um, all right, somebody keep keep a list for me because I'm not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Drugstore Cowboy, Dog Day Afternoon. Um, and I feel like there was another one we talked about recently that you were just like, yeah. you've never seen that? And I was like, we've talked about the fact that I've never I seen know, that. But I don't remember one. what it was. Oh, well. All right. But Yeah, but thank you very much to Anonymous for this. I hope that you all enjoyed our coverage of it. And um, in a couple weeks, we're going to be doing two episodes of a TV show that Anonymous, two separate episodes of two separate TV shows that Anonymous um commissioned i've lost the word commission there for a second and i was about to say constructed and that's not it at all um so keep an eye out i will make an event for those and uh thank you all for listening and toodaloo motherfuckers bye guys Spoiled Network Podcast.